Well, hello and welcome to The Wrap, episode number 34. It's Thursday, March 9th, 2023. I'm Nathan Guerra. Anna Russell is sat next to me virtually coming out of New Zealand. I'm coming out of uh, Wisconsin of the United States. And this is a show rounded up all things Zwift from the last week. Racing, events, tech, fashion, of course as well as what we're up to on Zwift and in the world of racing. We are live on Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook today. And today on The Wrap, we've got, what have we, obviously, what have we been up to for the last week, as always, the Zwift Racing League playoffs, the Tour of Watopia, a question from the listeners that tends to come up a lot we're going to address today, what exactly is Zwift Craft? And the announcement that Zwift is going to be at the Olympics? Pretty interesting. Our guest today is Leah Thorvalson, Zwift Academy winner, community builder at Zwift. Pretty awesome to have her on the podcast today. And of course, we're going to be doing all of the fashion stuff at the end of the show, which I really like actually the fashion picks today. They're pretty, pretty do interesting. You? Yes, I do. <laughs> I actually really do. And it probably okay. is because... Okay. 
They are the golden dragon. They are like one of them is the golden dragon. It's like it's <laughs> it's the it's the coolest of the cool. One of the coolest of the coolest. Because at my at at my heart, I am a racer. So that, that's 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 part of what it is. And it doesn't really have to do with what it looks like. It just has to do with the fact that it's earned through racing. So let's get right on into it, Anna. How's it going? Yeah, pretty good. I've got to say I'm a little fatigued this week. I commentated straight after last week's show. I, I literally kind of got dressed, got in the car and drove to Topor where I was commentating Iron Man. Now that is a long commentary gig. That starts at five in the morning and finishes at one in the morning. So there's a lot of talking there. That's like 20 hours. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. Saw quite a few Zwifters who I know out there racing. So it was really cool. Um, but I think I carried that fatigue a little bit into the week. I did three, three tour of Watopia stages. So what I'm trying to do is I'm doing like a long ride each week. And so, because I've learned now this revelation of zone two, I'm doing the A, B and C option for each stage all at once. But one of them I'll race, uh, well not race, but do a little bit harder. So it's kind of sandwiched in the middle. I don't know if that is like a thing, but it was fun. So easy and then one of them was a little bit harder and then finished off with the short one which was like a bit of a cool down so yeah that was cool and yeah playoffs we had our playoffs on wednesday my time and yeah i i have just come to the conclusion i'm done with swift racing for a little while <laughs> like i think the problem is right is i i had my daughter like 18 months ago had a bit of a break and then used racing to get back into like some top end because I was so desperate to race again because I had huge FOMO when I was pregnant. Started racing, but I st it's been like a year of racing now. And I was like, I think- No structure, no know, structure. See the coach is no, coming out. Just, I'm like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, like just- No, just some racing and like, let's just get back into this. Structure is in like, let's get fast and some workouts. So I got some good workouts, but nothing easy. It was all hard. And then I was sitting in there in the start pens for the playoffs. I was like, oh, hopefully I have a dropout. <laughs> you know? Oh, and when like, you're saying, hopefully I oh, have a dropout. No. Yeah. And I just, um, yeah. So I think mentally, yeah, I messaged the team and was like, good luck for the other two races, guys. I am like fried. I just want to, it's, it's still really sunny here and it's hot and I'm going to go gravel riding this weekend. So I think, yeah, just change it up a bit. What about you, Nathan? What have you been up to? Yeah, I needed a, now that's really interesting on the commentary, the 20, did you say 20 hours of commentary? Whew, that's a 20, big, yeah. we used to do those here a little bit. Uh, once in a while we'd have these, I can relate a little bit. And that is, I, I remember taking naps and while there was something going on or something and then being able to jump back in real quick, just like a little 15 minute nap or something. Cause we used to do these charity 24 hour rides, uh, with Zwift or things like that. And man, those longer yeah. stints are, they're big. I can relate. But, uh, for me, what I've been up to, uh, I actually, I was wondering cause DSing, are you going to DS a little bit too, when it comes to the Zwift, you know, racing league and the finals and everything, because I've DS this past Tuesday and really enjoyed it. I just I just happened to be at my computer and they needed a guy. I was like, I can't be, but I was working on something and I was like, I'll just sit in, I'll jump into Discord. I know the guys are going for it. So I, I DS'd a little bit for OMG and they really appreciate it. Really enjoyed it. It was actually a lot of fun and was able to give them uh, some tips and hints and stuff. And um, so I, I did that on Tuesday for Zwift Racing League. But uh, what I've been up to for training, this is my final like, big block with intensity uh with so it's like you do you know traditionally you have like three base um phases right and so this is my final phase i'm you know into and and this is one of the first times it's gone so well because a lot of times um the way that they were structured for me i'm not the best at following my own recipes right i'm not the best at following my own uh feedback and uh tracking very well where i'm at I'm, i tend to push i tend to just like always wanting to go that little extra more to train that little extra more and it just keeps coming back into my head like train smarter not harder train smart and and the funny thing is is the smarter i train right now actually the harder i can go when it's really really time in the middle of these which has been really nice to see mm -hmm. and so i'm really 
excited about the training right now because I've been able to like ride the edge of the cliff. And like, I've always got this picture in my head when I'm either like in coaching or I'm doing it myself at, in, in this season of uh, my understanding of training as an athlete and as a coach, I always have this picture of a cliff and like, are you going just to the edge and getting the views of that Grand Canyon or are you jumping into the Grand Canyon right now? Oh, I think, think I'm halfway you know? down. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm like free falling. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so it's like a lot of threshold work right now um, on the edge mixed with massive hours and like zone three stuff, right? And so like I'm yep. really watching the heart rate, making sure it doesn't hit those spots that it's not supposed to while getting the maximum out of my power. Last night, I think I did like a three hour SST and I didn't realize how hard that SST long was like. It's essentially just a limits ride. It's like, what can you do for two hours and 10 minutes? Go. Like, it was like, oh, ouch. Man. But anyway, so that's what I've been up to as far as on the bike goes. A little bit of racing, too, to try and um, just throw some intensity in there because the first race is coming pretty quick. About two weeks or so, we'll be in Moab. Um, we're leaving immediately after our coverage, actually, of the, of the final team time trial of the Zwift Racing League. So that's, uh, that's what I'm up to. Um, so let's jump right in maybe to ZRL because that's kind of what we were just on. Uh, how did, yeah. there was a Death Star out on Tuesday night, I noticed. Um, something happened. What's that? <laughs> so, well, it's two things. Like, if you've oh, yeah? ever been oh, on yeah. the Scotland, so it was, it was something we noticed in the commentary that there's a big moon that looks yeah. like yeah, the yeah, Death yeah. Star. As you're uh, descending, true. you can see it off of the skirt. And so if those that are just jumping in, like, what are they talking about? So it, the race was um, Hill Climb Carnage is what they called this race specifically. It, oh. WTRL did. And I'm actually writing a post right now about uh, the new, like, what, what all went down this past Tuesday. And uh, that's not the official name of the format. It needs a format and a name yeah. at this point. And man, like this new format, I really, really enjoy it from a commentary standpoint, like from a like what's going on with the story. I mean, Anna, maybe before I go on here, uh, you give me your yeah. insider's view of what you think, because essentially it's just motivation to just demolish everybody if you can. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, and we had Kristen Kolchinski, who she said was tired. And I was like, well, you tired is still probably like 20% better than everyone else. But it was, um, I love, I love the format. I got to say, I love, um, and this is kind of, it's hard, it's hard to touch on. I did just put a post up on the um, WTRL Facebook uh, page for uh, Swift Racing League is, after four years, I kind of, in the last season, like the last round, round three, I was just kind of getting a bit like ho-hum, you know, like, okay, like FTS, FAL, TTT, -T -T, you know, like I wasn't sort of feeling super jazzed. This one I was feeling quite like jazzed about because it was a different format. So 45 minutes, go as far as you can, basically, um, on what is quite a brutal course. Now, I probably didn't pace it right. I think I was like third or fourth fastest time up the climbs. And then I like didn't get an anvil and did one of the descents at threshold because I like <laughs> couldn't, I was trying to desperately get back on. I was literally riding four watts. Okay, kg. A lot of people found the themselves in that position, yeah. I think. And we can talk about that in a minute. I'm going to make yeah, I sure think we we'll come talk, back to that. I think I'll talk about that now because I think... Okay. Oh man, I feel like I, I don't I don't want to complain about power ups because I've been such an advocate for them. But I it's the similar one to I think when we did a sprinting course and I talked about it how like if you get an arrow, you had this big advantage in every single sprint to be getting FAL. And it was like a an overriding it, it was one of those ones like unless you had it, you uh you kind of had to sit in a little bit. And I think it was like this, like Christina Grossman and I we didn't have the anvil on one of the decisive descents and we just blew, like blew ourselves up trying to stay on it. And I think, I don't know, like someone may be able to tell me, I think it was made worse by the fact you're on a gravel bike on a gravel descent. So you're not even going that fast anyway. Like I could barely get in super tuck. Um, I could barely get up to 60K an hour just 
hauling ass down this hill. So, and I think at Worlds, it was, I mean, at Worlds, it <laughs> was nuts. Like I think Teppo, you know, he got caught out and got shot out the back. I know Jackie got caught out and got shot out the back, but at least at Worlds, everyone had an anvil. So you could essentially, you just had to drop it at the right time. This one, like if you got an arrow or a feather, like you kind of were a bit stuffed and also you kind of got ahead of people. And then I'd look at the ones behind me and I was like, that girl was 40 seconds behind me at the top of the climb. And I could see it was like 40, 39, 38, 37, da, 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 past me. I'm like, whoa, like it was insane. I don't know your thoughts, but I don't, I really struggle because I don't, I love power ups, but not in a like, in a way that is so disadvantageous if you don't have it. And I think this was one of those races. I, so the comparison that you made, we have a direct comparison that I really like to a situation where very high-end athletes are uh, on this exact descent with anvils on regular bikes, right? And so I have a feeling a lot of things create a perfect storm where the term overpowered can be used decisively. And the perfect storm, I think, is exactly what you said. You had gravel bikes involved on the downhill that they speed up anyways, right? But you don't have this situation where you have as much of a draft through the dirt as you usually get. So you're already kind of struggling with a little bit of a draft, which is fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But then on top of that, you already you, – so that you add the, the anvil and – with the anvil and the amount of speed that these gravel bikes can get on those those dirt sections, it they just go so fast. On regular bikes, it 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 doesn't go. They don't go quite as fast through the dirt section, so the speeds didn't get so high. So that would have brought things back a little bit. I think that there were a lot of people who didn't have anvils or didn't use anvils in worlds that were able to hang on perhaps a little bit easier or they, they didn't use them at exactly the right time, but they were able to jump in. But they, again, you're right. They did at least have one to work with. So I think that um, in this situation, I'd have to agree with you. I'm not necessarily complaining. Um, I just, I, I do think though that this was an overpowered situation for sure. I, re I really, really do. I watched it over and over again. And it was a situation that unless you rolled the dice here correctly, you and the, uh, and the opposition used it somewhat correctly to get away from you, it was going to happen. And there was almost nothing you could do about that. That's exactly where I would agree with people saying, that's too much gamification. I'd actually say that's not even actually gamification because gamification is mm. um, the heart of gamification is you go on the playground, you play a game, and you get people who want to return to continue playing the game. Like, that's a situation where this, there's nothing gamey about this at all. A game is something I want to play, and I have some sort of a way to do things. This is just like yeah. slot machines. And we encourage people not to gamble. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like that's... And I don't, um, I don't know the, enough into the detail of the power-ups and specific riders, but is, would this sound correct to you that, I mean, I'm in the A category woman. Now, across the most part, we are obviously lighter than, say, C category men. Like we're just, a, on average, a lighter bunch of riders. Now, does that mean the feather makes like less of an impact for us because i find the feather like it's powerful but it doesn't you're not shooting off the front but for us the anvil however that mechanism works is like insane so i don't know if it's like a it's it's affecting our kind of group really overly like is that is, would that be right in the I way think, the mechanisms I, I of think those work? I th no, I think you are correct is that it will have a little bit more of a percentage of an effect um, on a lighter group of riders because a lighter group of riders is already traveling downhill slower than a heavier group of riders. So I, I would think that um, with a lighter group of riders and the way that things function on Zwift on a downhill, you're not going to gain quite as much speed. You throw 50 kilograms of anvils in there and yeah, you're going to get a percentage. There will yeah. be a percentage that's greater than a heavier group of riders going downhill. I could definitely see that being a thing. 
Yeah, it was it all in all though, like to be fair, anvils or no, like I was a blown up wreck of, you know, a bag of nails there after the first climb. So I don't think for me, you know, like it wasn't like it was a game changer and I didn't win the race because of an anvil. But I will say like I think my strategy was not right. So I went for fastest time segment up the first time we went up for that one and then the next time up the shorter one. And then there were anvils and on the descent when I was hoping to recover, I just had to like haul ass at like four watts a kg and never really got on them. And the only power up I had was an arrow. And I was like, well, when do I use this? Because by the time I got to the flats, I was completely cooked. And then, and then the time just went like, longer longer and then if the front group was dropping any anvils in a group their descents were like unbelievably fast while I was like alone so I think like the time just like went out and went out and went out and went out but interestingly I went and had a look at the points and say we had Jen Real who was off the front in a, a group ahead of mine now she was a decent amount but the actual points that that equated to wasn't that many um from the number of meters she'd covered so i think for every 100 meters you got a point it actually didn't equate to many so i was still one of our team's highest point scorers based on those fastest through segment even though i was in like a few groups behind so it was kind of less of an impact than i thought it would be so yeah if i had feedback to martin i'd say i love the way that is i think going into next rounds like next season is to maybe weight those points a bit heavier and de-weight fastest time, fastest through segment a little bit. Because I think still, the fact that I did that, you know, was third or fourth fastest time segment still had a huge weighting on my points. Um, and I know we've talked about that before, that fastest through segment I think is a bit overweighted at the moment. I think we could dial that back and it would make for some, still some interesting races. I'd agree. I, I really, really do like the format though. The incentive for the riders to push extremely hard to break things up to get those extra points it gives everybody something to play for for all the talents mm -hmm. on the team i really really enjoyed that part of it and i think yeah. um this is a format that i think we should see more often honestly i, I really absolutely do like, yeah. like i i really uh enjoy it i could see it being one or two races a season um you know and and i really like it that it's creating this breadth um it needs a name i'm throwing out there um what was it oh come on i had i had it was like points time oh, yeah. chaser or something along oh, those like it's a, yeah. you're chasing points right so so in zgp they have the points hunters right i was yeah and, and, points and I was chaser like, i think points chaser but then there was the time clock thing in there so i was like hmm time chaser points time yeah. chaser something Do along those think... lines do you think, because what they do in the duathlon is, because they've had this for years in the duathlon is there's no FTS or FAL. Do you think maybe just scrap FTS and FAL for this this format and you're literally just going for points distance like they did here, but you don't have the FAL and FTS kind of coming into the equation. So it's purely, you get points for distance covered. I think that that would like You'd have to have a really cool. hard like course just, for that. Because you'd like, I, I yeah, agree, yeah. I agree, but the course would have to be such that it would break things apart. The other thing is like, I do, so I, I kind of like it because it's like, uh, the FTS and the FAL, or at least an FAL, throws this other thing in there that mm. makes it so that you have this opportunity to play off the back of some other objective. So like, there's another yeah. objective going on and then that maybe puts people in a place where they have to use resources for that other objective. And you can focus on the meters getting away objective. Whereas if everyone's just on the meters objective, it's going to end up again in that situation where that's what everyone's thinking about. And it's just going to be about breaking everyone somehow. And I'm like, that's fine. Yeah. Cool. I kind of like it if there's this other objective that you can kind of be like, I know they're focusing on this, but I'm going to focus on this now instead and get away. Yeah. And they're not, and, and they're not so at mm -hmm. odds with each other where it creates confusion. I feel, I feel like yeah. that separation of objectives actually creates uh, clarity actually a little bit. So mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I, I, I think that would be awesome as well to just do a, a points chase, like 
off of the, the clock. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it might neutralize things a little bit if we take away yeah, the FAL and the FTS. Yeah, true. Because a rider like me just went for FTS and then blew up, but still had heaps of points, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Um, but I did like it. I mean, it was... <laughs> so I watched, we had Cy on the other week to talk through all these courses and I'd seen his recon and he went up and over three times in 45 minutes. So in my head, I'm like, cool, three times. We hit the third time up and I'm like, we haven't even done 30 minutes yet. I was like, I feel broken. Like I was just looking at the clock. It got to that last 10 minutes. I was like, 10 minutes nine minutes, eight minutes, and then just trying to beat as many people in that last, like, that part was quite cool. The the tactics in the last three minutes where you know where you're going to be on course. So I was like, I know I'm going to be on the climb. I've got a feather. I'm with like five other people. And I was like, when do I attack these guys to get a hundred meters, right? To get that one point. And so that was quite fun. Like just watching the time tick down and figuring out when to go. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it is really awesome that they've got that new new kind of format that they can throw into the mix if segment battle points isn't quite ready. It's amazing to me how many things that we could actually talk about with this now that you're opening up like box after box because when you just said that, it did create a lot of really cool moments where people could get one more time through the banners as yeah. well. And like yes. there were people who made it and then there were people who were one second off. Like... For those yeah. extra points that they could grab through the banners. I mean, there, there was a lot of cool stuff that, that played out there, I feel like. And uh, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and then it'd be interesting to see how it plays out on some other courses. That course, I, to your whole point, with having Scion a couple of weeks ago, and then it was like, oh, shoot. Like, there's four times, and we're still going to be commentating four more times. I thought we were only doing, like, maybe one extra one oh. over the top. I, like, it ended up being eight to ten. Some of them did. Yeah. I think oh, some of them did. Oh, it was insane. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's move on. Uh, we're, wow. We really went on with that. I know. Right. So just so everyone knows, before the show, Nathan's like, oh, Anna, the topics are a bit light. I think we need to throw some more in. I was like, we talk for so long about the minutia of detail of like one race. Um, should we have a, because I know we were going to cover it last week, but we didn't, was what is Zwiftcraft? Um, because I know we mention it quite a lot. So we can cover this one shortly. I mean, I can give yeah. my opinion of it. But Zwiftcraft for me is basically um, the ability to position yourself well in races be able to attack at the right times, the ability to sort of have some team tactics in there. It's all of the nuanced part of Zwift racing that isn't just laying down high power. So it's where you see a rider who maybe has less power winning because they've recovered at the right times, they've attacked at the right times, and they know the game inside out. It's kind of how I would explain Zwiftcraft. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. It's your ability to know the in-game environment, to know the physics of the game in a way that you can manipulate it to win races. I think, like, uh, Zwiftcraft is the ability, like you said, there is no um, wind in-game, so you have to use depth perception. You have to use the perception of the speed. You have to be somebody who looks at your wattage and goes, my wattage doesn't actually represent how fast I'm going right now. This is just one example within all mm -hmm. of what would be Zwiftcraft of like, so when I'm good at Zwiftcraft, I'm not wasting watts because I know that the speed that I'm traveling is going to be such that I didn't go flying past an individual. Instead, I just jumped right on the wheel because I was able to understand the depth between me and that other avatar. And, you know, uh, this is the whole Aim Labs idea that I have with um riding with pacer bots is that i go out and i hang out with a pacer bot and i try and see how low of a watts per kilogram i can possibly hold with different levels of pacer bots and then get really frustrated with other riders and myself as to okay how does this pack's dynamic and the way that it's interacting with itself 
how can I use it to position my avatar as best as I possibly can? And some people are like, what are you talking about? Position your avatar. Your avatar just kind of goes places. Actually, if you use your Watts to try and control your avatar, you'll start to notice that your avatar will slot in certain ways and move left or right, even just off of how pr much you press the pedals or don't press the pedals at certain times in order to slot in. And so learning those things, that's Zwift craft. It's craft. And one of the main ways you can look at it is go to a results list and then Zwift power, it shows you yeah. here's the Watts per kilogram of these riders. These ones have put out five Watts per kilogram. They haven't been attacking off the, well, not five, whatever it might be. They, they haven't been attacking off the front. They've just been wasting watts because this individual yep. has done a full watt per kilogram less. So that's Zwiftcraft essentially. Yeah, exactly. I'd agree with that. Okay, last one before we bring in uh, our guest, Leah Thorvalson. Zwift at the Olympics. Now, this was kind of a <laughs> an interesting um, announcement, I think. Uh, I saw it on Zwift Insider and a few people sort of messaged me it. Um, it kind of, it looks a, a very similar to what they did. Okay, so I guess it's two part. It's very similar, it seems, to what they did last year where it was the Olympics is trying to um, get in with the cool kids and see how gaming and computer-based sport has any role in the Olympic movement. So last year it was all about mass participation. So there were those like Olympic events you could sort of join in. They had like a name and you it was just mass participation and kind of doing it. This time around, it looks like they're adding in like a competitive element. Uh, so from what I can see, they're going to be selecting riders to race each other at a venue, it seems like. We don't really know much about it. There's sort of like no qualification process. It's not like Worlds. I think riders will be cherry picked, um, probably riders who are not only good, but have a good reach out into the uh, sort of esport community. Um, and there's a whole lot of different sports too that are in there as well who'll be doing the same thing. Um, I'm not sure. I have, I, I'll hold judgment until I see what it looks like because I have no idea. At the moment, I'm sort of like, okay, I mean, it, it sounds cool. People going into an arena and racing each other and having the IOC Olympic sort of stamp of approval on it seems really good. I think what I would prefer i feel like the ioc it's a bit of a tick box like tick we're looking at gaming whereas i think i would prefer to just see it as like an exhibition sport at the olympics but i think like i don't know i think from seeing this my thoughts that that is going to happen have now gone even further to the side of i don't think we're going to be seeing cycling esport at the traditional olympics anytime soon huh interesting i i yeah. don't i don't know i feel like it's an exhibition to see which one of these stick so they have a whole bunch of them on the list and of um different esports that will be a part of this event uh with the ioc this summer in singapore i believe it is and i feel like out of all of them Zwift have a, a a really high chance like like of being something that's like mm. huh or virtual cycling has a really high chance of being something that's like oh this actually makes sense to couple with the uh olympic movement you know the conversation actually in-house here like about well is gaming a sport and i was like well is chess a sport i was like to be honest the way in which um is break dancing a sport is break that well if there's a competition to it like yeah. now is now that that there's not a for me on that front there's stuff that has more discretionary things in the olympics about who the winner is based mm, on subjective a whole lot versus of subjective yeah. versus objective winners that i would go mm -hmm. It's just, it's more of a sport, the more objective it is that there is a winner and the more effort has to go toward that. Now the efforts within figure skating are absolutely amazing. Sometimes I'm like, what? Like, but, but like only because of the objective versus the subjective thing, right? Like that, that's the one yeah. where I go, like, there's just people judging, like, and, but they've got it down to a pretty good science within these and they've gotten those criticisms. So right on. Cool. Like, 
Um, so, anyways, that's a whole. We, I mean, that's a big can of worms. Are we could do a whole. I think for a lot on that I one. Think, but um, with that the Olympics, I like it that there's an exhibition. I understand the feedback that, like, hey, like, if we're gonna like push this as being at the Olympics, it needs to have a similar like feel of qualification and getting to the Olympics and that whole thing. Like, 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 it needs to be set up front that like this is a test. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like that, that would be a good way. That would be kind of cool if that was out there, I think, because right now people just have a lot of questions. Yeah. And I think once that it does get out there and we know more about it and we see the formats, I think we'll get yeah. someone on and we'll talk about it and it'll be like an actual show on what this is. I think at the mm -hmm. moment we can just conjecture that, I mean, it's cool. I like anything where we get to showcase Swift a lot more and showcase awesome races. So tick from me. And then I'm kind of excited to go into a lot more depth once those sort of details are released and get excited about what it could look like. So there we go. 100%. That's kind of the, uh, yeah. So anyways, that'll be really cool. Uh, I think, I, I, I don't know, Singapore. Holy cow. Like that's, I've always wanted to go. There's actually some pretty cool Zwifters and like cycling that goes on, even though it's like a very small place for cycling. There's actually like some pretty awesome cycling that goes on there too. I have a feeling that the people in Singapore are going to be like, whoa, because they're like super into yeah. esports and there's like a cycling culture there as far as I can see a little bit. Ah, so absolutely. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, let's jump in with our guest and uh, it is the VP of Snacks herself at least that's what i'm being told that she is called if you don't know why we'll get into that because uh you know leah thorvalson it's great to have you on the program if you don't know who leah thorvalson is i don't know and you're listening to this podcast you must have been under a rock for the last five to six years maybe i don't know because she's the first ever zwift academy winner she's also a community builder at zwift and she does the most amazing review of british biscuits uh because and and you know when it comes to that, I'm always like, I need, I've never actually had a hobnob to this day, I don't oh, think. And I'm so kind of good. regretting that we didn't order some to eat them today, actually. Leah, welcome to the program. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. I am just, I'm a little bit floored that you've never had a hobnob. <laughs> well, this is it. <laughs> I might have to leave the podcast. <laughs> well, well I'm, this is me, like, this is oh, no. me, like, you know, shooting out this like request to the general public to suddenly <laughs> receive some hobnobs in. The, in Can somebody, the... please send Nathan hobnobs. The chocolate <laughs> on one side ones. They're the best. Oh, they're so good. So, Leah, I um actually kind of connected with you because I was messaging about some events and you emailed back. I was like, whoa, hold on. Hello. What are you up to these days? And wanted to have you on the podcast to kind of talk about that. And I guess as we have with most of our guests is to give a bit of an origin story of how you got onto Zwift, maybe a bit, you can go into your Zwift Academy stuff, but yeah, give us a, a bit of a history. Sure. Yeah. I'll try to do the cliff notes version. Cause I feel like every time I tell this story, I end up going into the weeds. So I'll try not to, but my athletic background started as a runner. Um, I was an elite level competitive marathoner for several years and much like with cycling, I mean, I loved the sport, but I also loved the community aspect of it. I love to travel to races. So it's like where most elite marathoners will pick maybe two marathons a year. I would usually do like eight or nine just because <laughs> I liked to do them so much and probably pushed, asked a little bit too much of my body. Um, although it's frustrating. I know some people that are like in their seventies and run multiple marathons a year and they're still cracking, but for me, there came a point where things started to break down and eventually I had four surgeries over the course of three years. And after the final one, it was pretty intense. It was a, a bone graft to my femur. And they said, well, you can't do any high impact activity for a year. And, you know, endurance athletes, most of them, whether they recognize it or not, are some sort of endorphin junkie. So I just was like, well, what am I going to do now? Like, to not be able to run for weeks after surgery was one thing, but for a year, that was just like, I'm going to have to do something else. So as I was recovering from my biggest surgery, I registered for a hundred mile ride and I hadn't even bought a bike yet, but I was just like, I guess I'm going to start cycling. <laughs> and when I was doing that, I knew already I had a follow-up surgery scheduled six months later. So this was like, 
I think I rode my first bike ride was July 5th. I don't know why I remember that, but it was or sometime early July. And then I had my follow up surgery in November. So I rode for a few months, but then I was sidelined again. And when I came back from that surgery, they said, well, you can ride an indoor trainer, like no riding outside for another two months because of the fall risk. So someone told me, well, you need to get on Zwift. And I'd never heard of Zwift. This was the um, winter, like December, November of 2015. So Zwift was pretty new. Oh, early. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, someone told me that I should try it. So I started just like spinning on like a static train in my garage. And I was just like, this is absolutely the pit. So when I heard about Zwift, I was just like, okay, this sounds like something like I can stand it. And I really wasn't doing anything more than just getting on and riding every day just the same way i would go and just go for a run like i wasn't doing any workouts or anything structure because i had no intention of ever racing on zwift let alone in the real world this was just like a patch to get me through till i could run again well one of my good friends and i still remember i was sitting in the back of a vehicle and i got this text from her and she sent me it was something about like zwift academy and she said Tom, her husband, Tom just saw this and you should enter because you would totally win. And I laughed because it's like, I always say to people, like I'm Pulaski County famous as far as running, like within Arkansas, I was a big running name, but it's like the farther out you get, I'm, I was good, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like people had, I think an inflated perception of how good they think they thought I was because I won local race. Like I won all of them. Like I won the Little Rock Marathon five times. So people are just like, you're going to win the Olympics. I'm like, no, there's actually a huge stretch. <laughs> I when love she that. said that to me, <laughs> when she said like, you would totally win. I remember looking at reading over what the Zwift Academy was and thinking, now, if this was running based prior to my injury, I could contend for a win. I wonder what the person is like like i wonder what the cycling regiment of someone who is actually going to win this is like like i just can't you know and i just kind of i i brushed it i didn't really think about it again until i was on zwift and then up popped i either got an email or like a pop-up for the mission or something like zwift academy starting i was like oh this is that thing like cool i'm gonna register why not maybe it'll at this point i'd had some friends saying you know i needed to start thinking about racing out real in real life racing and I was like, well, you maybe this will to. give me some. You need it. You need to think I about it. To. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, this will give me some structure. This will, you know, oh, okay. And that's when I discovered Zwift workouts because that year, Zwift Academy, for, for people who haven't been around Zwift a long time, it was a different card of apples back then. I mean, they were like an hour and a half, months. right? Oh, yeah. The workouts were really was, long. 27 workouts, nine group rides that you had to do to graduate. <laughs> every person participating had their profile like they had a page where you had a picture and like where you were from and so you could go in like because yeah. there was only i think 1200 registered so that gives it a bit of perspective whereas and it was just women so now you know it's men and women there's upwards of 150,000 participants i had a much smaller cohort to beat <laughs> but, but as it went on you know you're just kind of stalking the other competitors and looking at people's numbers and getting in these group rides and like oh, okay who seems like they're suffering and who seems like this is easy and i just and it was like if you made it to the semifinals, you got a smart trainer well at the time i had a kicker snap so i was like oh i get the upgrade to the wahoo you got a power meter for your bike which i didn't have and you got a canyon SRAM wow. jersey and i was just like I started thinking maybe this is possible. Like maybe I can make the semifinals. I don't know, but maybe. And and then I did. And I was just like, oh, this is amazing. This is awesome. And the same thing, you know, then it starts suddenly, then there's 12 women and you're just like even more nitpicking who's doing what and what what do their numbers look like? And am I anywhere in the ballpark? And it was kind of like I had a few pegged that I was sure would go to the finals, and then I had a few pegged that I was pretty sure wouldn't, but the majority, but the bulk of us, it was just kind of this very gray area of, I have no idea. So, and I was just thinking I could get a trip to Spain. I could meet these pros. Like it never, I still never fathomed that I could actually win because I knew behind, <laughs> behind the avatar, I had the power, but I also knew how comfortable I was on the road. I mean, it was, I never, when I started Zwifting, I'd never, started Zwift Academy, I'd never done a race outdoors. By the time Zwift Academy finals had come around, 
I'd raced outdoors, but never in a field of more than 15 women. So I was just like, well, they're going to see, it was kind of a joke until I got there. And then it wasn't funny that I was just like, they're going to see me on a bike and they're going to be like, well, she's out. But, um, and I'm, it's not that I was terrible, but I just, yeah. And then suddenly, you know, it happened. I made the finals and I was just like, oh, and then I got there and I was like, holy crap, like this is so intimidating because, wow. the, you know, it's like, I think that the, the whole concept of it has changed, but at the time, like there's these women who've been cycling since they were nine years old. And suddenly the three finalists show up, two of us are 37, one's 41. None of us have been cycling more than a year. I'm sure they were just like, what is this? You know? <laughs> so it's really intimidating. Just like, you know, the coolest thing of we're in Mallorca and every day we're doing this four or five hour rides, but I'm just like nervous about it. Like, yeah, well, I'm excited to go out and ride my bike, but feeling like they're looking at you and they can see that you're not comfortable and they can see like, you know, I couldn't descend for crap and I'm still not great at it. But anyways, I told you I'd get off in the weeds, but I did win the Swift <laughs> Academy and went overnight from being cat four to a world tour pro. And I would not give it up for anything, but I would not recommend anybody do it that way. If you have a, if you have a way, to get, you know, and I, I always say any more, I don't think it would be highly unlikely that somebody with less than a year of race experience would even get to the finals because they have such a broader range of athletes vying for those spots. And, and you know, and that it was never intended to be that way. Like it just wouldn't be a good experience. So while I would encourage anyone out there who has the itch or the interest to go for it a hundred percent because worst case you're going to learn some things and get some fitness but i think it's just infinitely more difficult to win now <laughs> so i was yeah, definitely at the right place at the right time i could see like a discovery the only thing i could see there is like the discovery of a very athletic person who hasn't discovered their talent who has like all the tools somehow like like i jumped into mountain biking but i've been i i did a lot of bmxing when i was young and so that i think gave me this like because i didn't mountain bike ever until i was like in my late or early 20s and i just jumped on and bam i was winning races but it was from the bmx when i was a kid so if somebody showed up and hadn't really been cycling like and suddenly they just found this phenomenal vo2 max this phenomenal sufferability and they just happened to be that athletic person who could kind of just like jump in and they have that ability in a pack sud like within like two months you know what i mean like i could see that yeah. discovery happening but at, the, at exactly. the same time there's a whole nother thing where like you might have the fitness but this leads right into what was your experience like maybe in the pro peloton after winning with what exactly you're talking about it was terrifying i mean it was really terrifying and oh i mean the most embarrassing thing my first race ever in europe and i literally i i flew over and raced the next morning i remember this and i remember this oh actually, my god this. seriously yeah 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 Whoa. and i had had to use the bathroom so when the team started rolling to the start I went to the bathroom and apparently we had just, when we did sign in, we had been right by the start, but I'm not surprised in the bit. Like I didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't recognize, okay, we're just going back to where we were before. So I start rolling and I'm just like, I'm not, I'm the race starts in two minutes. Like I'm not seeing a start line. So I get on my race radio. I'm like, hi, this is Leah. Um, I don't know where the start is. And they're just like, you idiot. I'm sure, you know, like it's right where we just were for sign on. So I roll up, but it's like, at this point, everyone is packed in. And I just had to like Austin Powers with the go-kart my way into the front, like on the front, like with the people that got the call-ups. Cause there was just no way for me to make it to the back. And I was just like, I'm sorry. Oh, oh sorry. And like, <laughs> and, you know, these people are just laughing at me. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. And I don't know how long it was before I was shot out the back. It was not, it was not long. Um, I think I managed to hang in there for maybe 30 or 40 K, uh, but I, I didn't finish. I was, I was, was it, I got a question. I did so finish my second race. was it, was it, was it the elbow? Like not, not literal elbows, maybe literal elbows, but was it the 
closeness and the reality of how much is conserved by like just being very, very comfortable being shoulder to shoulder? Or was it the speed or a combination of both? That's no, no, a really no. like- was, Well, it was the proximity. Like I immediately went onto the back because there I had space. Like I, and mm. I've gotten better, but I'm still not great about like people, you know, what, what, what's, what's your personal bubble? And pro racers in Europe, there is no bubble. Like, it's not like you can't, and I found, you know, after it's like, okay, I'm trying to get more comfortable with this. There's no way to train it because even if you're on a bunch ride, I mean, you're riding two by two, or maybe you come to a mm-hmm. sprint, but it's like mm-hmm. in those Pelotons, I mean, you see it when you watch on TV, it's just like stacked. It, it feels to me as close as avatars on Zwift get where it's just so like, like handlebars everywhere. And these people come and they <laughs> move into these spots. I'm like, that was not a spot. <laughs> that was, so that was I, the way spot. I was it, like the, the people say rubbing elbows, but I think at the really, really high level, it's rubbing hip. It, you're rubbing hips and you know mm. what I mean? It, it's that much closer that you're literally at yeah. times hips to handlebars and people are keeping it upright. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like, I found my comfy zones were on the back, on the front or in the wind. <laughs> like <laughs> I just needed to have an opening. I just needed to have some place I could go. And so it's like, and then when you get on the front, of course, the people start that washing machine, they start coming around you. And I remember being in one race and my teammate Alexis was like, she's like, you're great. You're great. She's like, just get on my wheel. And she got in front of me and I just saw this gap between the two of us, like every riders all around us. And, you know, people will, for a, a moment, when you see it's a teammate and a teammate, they were like, not going to take her wheel from me. But I just kind of shook my head and just faded straight out the back because it's just like, it was just too much. You know, it's just, um, yeah, it was definitely that the proximity and also the road size. I mean, <laughs> you, it, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of, you know, you could be on like a, a four lane road and suddenly turn onto a farm path that's like less wide than a bike path in the states and so you've got 120 wow. women trying to squish into this little space and yeah it was just it, really that was high level like high high adjustment too like real quick adjustment within and everyone's used to that and the speeds of being used to that are super high so it's like whoa like, I, like it's really funny because it feels like i don't associate the pro peloton road to that necessarily all the time in my head but I I'm getting this like, wow, there's some really fast agility adjustments that are actually going on within those Pelotons that people might not realize. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've also got the um, dynamic of like using the team cars. I remember the first time they're like, use the car, use the car. And I mean, I've never trained on a moto or anything in my life. So I'm just like, probably riding three feet back. They're like, closer, closer. I'm just like, are you crazy? Like, I don't, I, I've never done this. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. So how long did your experience in the pro peloton last? Sort of a couple of years or what was the sort of journey through that? And when did you make the decision that that was enough? Well, it wasn't my, it wasn't my decision. Um, it was, it was that I, I was fortunate enough, you know, I did improve in my first year. I got a lot of race experience in that year. Um, I still had a long, long way to go, but I think between Zwift and Canyon SRAM talking, they decided to give me another season and see how I continued to improve. Unfortunately, and, and, this is what was hard with the second year was that I just didn't get raced. Now, would it have made enough of a difference for me to improve enough to stay on any team? I don't know, but I just didn't get, I think I got like 18 race days total. And then at the end of it was kind of told, um, you know, you haven't made the progress that we would have hoped for. So we won't be giving offering you another season, which I expected. And it was just kind of the frustration I think for me was just like, well, how was I going to get better when it's like, I moved to Girona and from February to May, I went to one four day stage race. I'm just like, I get why you're not bringing me because you're a pro team and you need to, you need to win bike races. So I understand it. But if you were going to give me a shot, you know, I, I wish I would have had more of a real shot, but it's fine. Um, in that time, you know, I, I, I not only made tons of friends, saw 
all sorts of places around the world I never would have been to. And I got close with the people at Zwift. So when that transition ended, you know, as I kind of moved into working for Zwift and that helped me feel like I stayed connected instead of just being like the Zwift Academy winner and this, you know, having, having this place and having this family and then just having it all dropped, you know? Um, and I still, you know, when I watch women cycling now, it's like, I still feel like Canyon Sram is my team, even though there's only two riders on the team anymore that were there when I was around, <laughs> but it's just, it, it's, it's been fun to have those connections or, you know, have people that I met or brushed elbows with that, it does make it more personal to watch. You know, it's like I, I, I love watching all cycling, but I especially love watching women cycling because I know some of them. And I feel like I know, I just feel like I know the emotion and the experience to an extent, even though I never reached the top of the top level. I got to, I got to feel it. I got closer to it than a lot of people would ever even dream of. So it was, yeah. I want to really great so piggyback off of that then it did from my outside perspective watching you now in cycling though it did launch you domestically quite a bit it feels like to me though like you came back domestically north america and have had some pretty cool results and teams to ride for it seems like yeah i mean i think it definitely opened doors or gave me at least an opportunity to be able to say I don't have big results, but I have ridden in the world too, or I, I maybe have some knowledge to where people were willing to bring me on and let me guest ride. Um, and now I've been with the same team with three TQM for the last three years. And not that they have designated our team this way, but I think and it seems to me like we've got a number of masters riders and then we kind of bring in some up and coming riders. Like last year we, we had, two riders that were con consistently on the podium all season. And then they've moved now to a UCI paid team. So I think it's, it's fun to watch, you know, and even think that I had any little part, even if it was just like, I was the teammate who lightened the mood at the race. <laughs> Maybe that's all I contributed that day, but or just to be able to kind of help launch some of these younger cyclists into their careers is, is fun. Yeah. So Leah, I think from, I mean, your story, which is amazing, by the way, I think you're in quite a unique position, I guess, to give your opinion on where do you see women cycling from when you first kind of came into it at the Zwift level in 2015, you know, crazy mm -hmm. story being in the pro peloton then and racing around Europe. How have you seen the evolution? And I mean, now with Zwift, you know, supporting the Tour de France fam and um, Perry roubaix and events like that healthy sport do you see it just growing what are your thoughts um it's definitely improved a, a lot um just as far as you know there are there are some teams starting to have development they're not actually calling them u23 but in the way that the men's peloton has u23 teams and even ranks and races i think that's as, as far as the development athletically of the riders i think there's still room to grow there i think that if they could get the funding that teams need to have you know a full team of younger riders or a full development team or like what canyon sram is doing with generation which i mean is a little bit different from just being development that's more about inclusion as well but though all those things are moving it in the right direction right um there's actually livable salaries now so i think with that, there comes complications. Like, of course, it's wonderful that now women can focus fully on cycling, but it also makes it makes everything more competitive. I'm not racing over there anymore, but I have heard chatter, you know, here and there about just like everyone's out for blood because it, it, to get to those upper level teams and actually be able to make a living and just be a cyclist instead of well i'm a cyclist but i'm also holding down all these jobs because it is a full-time job you know even though it's like yeah you're a lot of riding your bike and and stretching and fueling yourself properly but it's just like in the same way any other professional athlete dedicates everything they do around there so i think that's um the strides they've made with the salaries is great um i think that Zwift has been really 
they were kind of a, a leader in showing that it's possible. And I mean, yes, you could say it's easier to do on Zwift than in the real world because we don't have to have courses set up and security and all the things, but just saying women deserve equal coverage. Women deserve the same distance within reason. I think on, again, on Zwift, that's a little bit different than I don't, I don't, I don't personally think that women need to start riding 250 K stages. Like, mm. I don't think that's necessary, but having the longer stage races, having the tour de France, I think all of that, I think Zwift was a leader in that in saying, this is what we do. This is the way we want it. We're going to stand behind these bigger races, but we want them. We want it to be good. We're not just going to, throw money at this and let it be so, so like, we're going to get back behind this and we want it to be, we want it to be good. And we have long-term visions of how, you know, it's of what the Tour de France Femme of Exwift will evolve into. So yeah, I, I, I feel like that's my answer is kind of all over the shop right now, but I, I think it's moving in a really good direction. Um, I think there, it still has a long way to go, but definite improvement. I mean, from from the years that I was in the pro peloton, it's it's definitely come a long way. I would say that, and, and maybe just speak to this a little bit, but the esport side of it, there's a couple of major impacts. I see Zwift Academy being one where like esport pokes its head in and goes, "Hey, we're impacting this space." I see the women's mm -hmm. cycling thing as one of the biggest ones where you're seeing all of these women compete in an e-sport, getting opportunity in places that they don't have to like make as much personal sacrifices outside of what is athletics. Like what you said, what right. it is to ride your bike is how you should be able to show that you're one of the best to ride your bike and go ride your bike then if you're gonna go after that for professional. And I think the esports side of things opens up those opportunities from your living room in a new way for women's cycling. I feel like it's been one of the biggest boosters that Swift have brought to the, to the table. Yeah, I think, I think it goes both ways. I think both in terms of the Zwift Academy and even with the elite racing. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have a number on it and I, but I do know that people have been discovered out even outside of Zwift Academy. And there's several Zwift Academy semifinalists that have gone on to ride for world tour teams. So I think it goes in both directions, like both that they're getting visibility from being in the Zwift racing in the Zwift Academy, the coaches or whoever's recruiting for the teams are able to see those numbers. But I also think that it gave it viability when, you know, during the pandemic, a lot of pros really took to Zwift, started to see the value in Zwift, started to say, yes, this is a legitimate, not only a training tool, but also a legitimate place where, you know, you can, like, there's, there's really talented athletes here. So I think it's like having the more faith poured into Zwift from um, real pro cyclists and then Zwift bringing people and merging those two groups together so that somebody who maybe was an athlete, but maybe they didn't really even follow pro cycling, but suddenly they're, you know, virtually riding alongside these pros and so, and oh, they, well, what is, they want to find out more about that. So they start watching women cycling on TV or I want to do that. You know, it's like, I think mm -hmm. it all kind of grows together, like growing the interest, getting to know the characters, um, having that visibility for the riders, it all really works together well. So uh, we do have, we're running up against time for the fashion show. So last question though, <laughs> Leah, um, it says VP of snacks actually in chat. Uh, one of our <laughs> viewers just said the real VP of snacks. Like that's actually a position. <laughs> and they probably it's haven't not. seen your, they haven't seen your biscuit competitions. She had, so Leah, uh, you, she has a biscuit competition. Go check out her Instagram. We're not going to go into the biscuit competitions at this point about taste <laughs> testing. She does live on her Instagram. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it's actually why we got food on, on Zip with community live in the past, because we just referenced that and the people started sending us food actually. So oh, that's what, amazing. yeah. So what do, what do you do for Zwift now, Leah? Besides, yeah, yeah. The VP of snacks is definitely a self-proclaimed title. I did used to have it officially in my Slack profile, but HR got a hold of it. Now it says associate content programming specialist, like it should, but at heart, I'll always be the VP of snacks. So yeah, so I'm on the content programming team. Basically we do 
everything with events from kind of curating what that experience is going to be. My day to day is 90% um, setting up community events and making edits to community events, um, which it, when somebody asked me yesterday, what's a day in the life look like? I'm like, well, it's a lot of responding to emails and tickets, but I love it. Like, I think because I know the Zwift experience and I, I can envision so clearly when people write in what they want and being able to give them that experience back is just, it's kind of fun. And I get to know people and every now and then I'll have somebody who's like, wait a minute, are you the Zwift Academy, Leah? I'm like, yeah. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's fun. I feel like just staying engaged with the community in a different way. And then, you know, sometimes I'll be out on a ride on Zwift and I see the name of somebody who's sent me in a ticket a few days ago. So I always like to give them a ride on and wonder if they're like, that's the girl from community support. <laughs> but, but yeah, just events, all things event set up and, and editing and yeah, that's what I do. I really like that touch point. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool mm -hmm. that you have that touch that's point cool. to the community for sure. Well, Leah, thank you so much for being on. I really, uh, really, really, it was so great to get the full breadth of your story across Swift Academy, what yeah. you're up to uh, within Zwift now and in the community. And if you see uh, Leah out on, uh, on Zwift, give her a ride on and, and say hello. And um, it was great to have you on. And hopefully to see you out uh, racing this summer, actually, from a personal, I have noticed that you're, you know, still on it. So I'm excited to see, uh, see you out there hitting the, the roads again. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great chatting with you guys. Of course. All right. Thanks, Leah. All right. So that was awesome. Leah Thorvalson, Swift Academy winner and the VP of snacks. I need some biscuits now. I need a hop, wow. the hobnobs. Send was, hobnobs. Um, that was a wild story. I got to say, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> we did take it on a so journey much of there. it was wild. We take it on a journey. Yeah, I was like listening, like, it's wild to me that you take someone who's riding the indoor trainer, they're doing a crazy academy that was three months long with like 27 workouts or something. Then you literally the next year, you're like, move to Girona and race in the pro pellet. I'm like, that is nuts that's like almost you just drop an alien on earth and go survive you know like she said those <laughs> yeah, yeah. those races in europe i mean they'll be doing this from when they're nine years old they're, and they're doing it and then you suddenly are just dropped in there like man that would be a like even just living in a country where you don't speak the language is hard enough let alone trying to make a living in this incredibly competitive environment. And I mean, I get the feeling as well when I've seen um, sort of interviews, I know with New Zealand riders and Australian riders and I assume American as well, there's like a, a feeling when they go to Europe, like you've got to prove yourself. Like you you ain't gonna get any respect here until you prove something. So you, it's even harder to be like making your way through a peloton or doing well because and that's why like huge credit side note here huge credit to Kristen Faulkner for what she is doing in the pro women's peloton at the moment because like holy just just trying to make it in a euro dominant ton and stamp your mark and you know it's it's tough man so yeah what a wild story that's um that's crazy it's no joke I can handle a bike a little bit I'm used to rubbing shoulders in a mountain bike situation going into a single track as hard as you can and you know almost hitting trees and actually breaking collarbones and stuff but i've been in the north american pro peloton on the road and whoa okay that's how this is going as we're diving corners and so like and i here it's a whole i haven't been in the european pro peloton and that's another level even and just to oh, be yeah. thrown into the mix of that whoo Wow. Not on the line. So pretty insane. All right, let's jump into the fashion show, though, everybody. The jersey pick of the week as long as well as the garage pick of the week. So we I mean, we got actually a couple of different we got a lot of things going on here for the fashion. Action, so <laughs> yeah. Let us know what you think in chat, though. But uh, I like the pick up here. Let's go over the jersey pick, if that's OK first, Anna. Yeah. So jersey pick Tour of Watopia 2023. That's me on the bike wearing that. I went and rode all that and um, put it up. It's been getting like a solid man. It's interesting to hear some of the comments against these jerseys. It's been getting a solid seven. But then people who I assume are rating it low have just commented with like horrific, like terrible on the eyes. So it's quite polarizing. Wow. Um, I, per I, I personally I like, this like one it. a little bit. Yeah, I don't like 
I think you got a good setup going on there too, Anna. Like with the thank you, Thanks for the pink thing. Um, you have this really cool. Paired... So this is pretty cool too, as well. This is the yeah. The, so through, through the, the years. years, yeah. So in twenty eighteen, right through up to twenty twenty three, I've got to say, um, my fave is probably sitting there at the twenty twenty. I really, it kind of harps back to Team Velos, which I really like their jersey, that sort of blue with green color. Uh, really nice detailing on the shorts, and it's the blue shorts, which I really like. So, yeah, I'm going to go 2020 there as my favorite Tour of Watopia jersey. I'd have to agree with you. Yeah, that is, uh, I have, you know, the new one, though, for some reason, I'm really digging the new one. I don't know why. I think it's because it has a, to a, a total kit. It, that that avatar has a total kit on so it's like the cap the shoes the sock the, like you can yeah. kind of fit everything together there so i think that's the only reason why it's if you if it had a total kit for 2020 it would like shoot it way up for me uh I, i'd agree with you though it does nudge out 2023 so all right then when we have the garage pick this is the golden dragon okay for those that don't that know is. This is the earned World of Warcraft. I've mentioned it once in a while of having the, the bronze dragon or the golden dragon, something that you earn in game that you can show off as like, I earned this awesome piece of equipment that shows I am uber Zwifter, right? Like that's, that's uh, yeah. what this is, 100%. Yeah, this is a little sort of humble brag. You just wear it and, you know, if you know, you know. Um, and you do know, because I've seen people riding around with this, and I'm like, I know that you've done well. Um, I know Cy Bradley's going after this pretty hard. Uh, it's great. This was the first time, I think we talked about it on maybe a podcast or a show, like a commentary, that, yeah, this was one of the coolest things that WTRL did was releasing a actual item you can have in your garage that shows that you were in a top team. You know, like I think that more of that would be cool. But this is, yeah, I love it. Um, I just like the helmet too. I don't wear it super often, actually. I think watching this, I'm like, I might go put that on my avatar for a while. Season I've winner. I've got one in my garage. Season winner. That's how you get one of these. Uh, pretty awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my bronze dragon. I think I'm going to get one this <laughs> season. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. What happens okay. with that? But. Uh, all right, and then we do have a fashion in the field, like in this pick, the dinosaur. Yeah, suit. I um, so I totally forgot. Is this, the a, this is a dinosaur? Or is this the Kuji thing or whatever it's called? Is, I think I it's think like a, this is the Kuji thing. Or Kuju, it doesn't really look like a dinosaur. Like it kind of does. I called it a dino, but then looking closely, I'm like, it looks a little bit different. Um, but I totally forgot that this happened in the Tour of Watopia, that at certain points you just turned into this. Um, now <laughs> so the, all of a sudden you transformed yeah. into this monster and you're like, wow, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, well, because <laughs> I usually do my easy rides like Zwift is on one screen, but I'm doing my work on the screen that's in front of me. And so I was working and then suddenly I looked at Zwift and was like, what the hell is going on? And <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, I got to get a picture of this. Like, it was actually quite a shock. You like, tail all of a sudden in front yeah. of you. Like, why is this happening? I know. So, yeah, go do those rides. Like, they're a bit of fun. I quite like them. And you get, like, a lot of XP. So I'm leveling up real quick. A lot of extra power-ups out there. Go check it out. Tour of Utopia is going on right now. Last thing, we did see some questions in chat. And it is race or pace up the Alp. I'm doing it. Anna's doing it. Gabby's doing it everybody's doing it come and check it out uh <laughs> this does go alongside of the relaunch of vision cycling be on the watch out for that as well but uh race or pace up the alp the friend go for a pr attempt race it it's going to be this saturday at 12 p.m central time usa uh this is not uh a official race or anything this is really just a pace with a friend Give your full gas, best effort, up the Alp, challenge yourself. Uh, big shout out to M. Nyquist for this idea and helping to organize this. Again, just for fun, but we will have results on, uh, just so everybody can see uh, where uh, how you did. And jump in. I will go ahead and put the links for this in the descriptions. You can also jump into the Discord that we use that is in the description. You'll see links in there as well. And there'll be a uh, promotion going out immediately after this, actually, on my social media. Share it up. Let's get as many people as we can going up the Alp for your best pace that you possibly can. Anna, are you looking forward to pacing? Or after talking about Tuesday oh. and the ZRL, I'm wondering uh -huh. if you're like, ah. Oh. 
I'm going to be that annoying person. I got invited um, from a fellow school mom to go gravel riding, and she's an ex-professional marathon runner, so kind of like Leah there, who we were talking to. Uh, so I'm going to be gravel riding, my first ever gravel ride tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to have to see how that shakes out um, and then see how I go on Sunday. It's not so much whether I'm tired. It's more whether I can get the uh, – the time from the husband because usually I do a morning and he does a morning. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. I will gotcha. endeavor to see you there, but I might have to um do oh, a lot man, of we like future favors. We were so excited to see if Anna's get how Anna's gonna go. I, I think, think you, be, you I had think like I'll a time. You had like a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were shooting for I do want to be and there. I was like, oh, is that what yeah. Anna's going for? That'll be interesting to see how that goes. I think it'll be all right. I think yeah, I think I can make it. Because I mean it'll be less than an hour, right? So I think I can swing that with a husband. I'll just be like, as soon as I get off, you take the day off and you go ride your bikes. I, <laughs> I just have to nice do the things. negotiation. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Hey, let us know what time you're gonna go for on your racer pace the alp as well i want to know what times you everybody is shooting for all right thanks everybody for hanging out with us this is a podcast as well you can download the podcast anywhere that you can get a podcast go ahead and search zwift and the rap should be pretty easy for you we've been live on twitch youtube twitter and facebook make sure to hit those follow buttons subscribe comment to all those cool things it helps a lot and we will see you next week this has been episode 34 we'll be back for episode 35 next week of the rap as always from myself and anna right on